Hey guys, this is Tommy with Tommy Nation Politics. How's everyone doing today? Tommy Nation Politics. Bobby told me this later. And I know Jack said it to me sometimes. He said, Oh God, can you ever imagine what would happen to the country if Lyndon was president? So many times you'd say it or if there was ever a problem. I hope that you are doing all right. Oh, I'm doing fine. Thank you. Do you know how much we love you? You have a good Christmas there. Thank you. The same to you. Just as stunning are criticisms of the leader of the civil rights movement, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But they need to be understood in context. At the time, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover was trying to incite divisions between the Kennedys and Dr. King by telling Bobby Kennedy that Dr. King was overheard on FBI wiretaps making crude comments about Jackie Kennedy, kissing her husband's coffin on the day of Jack's funeral. The tapes were supposed to be locked in a vault for a century, but Caroline Kennedy decided to release them now, all eight and a half hours, uncensored. It just seemed to me such a shame when we came here to find hardly anything of the past in the house. The time is neutral. Hey guys, this is Tommy with Tommy Nation Politics. How's everyone doing today? It can be used either constructively or destructively. I'm absolutely convinced that the forces of ill will in our nation, the extreme rightists in our nation, have often used time much more effectively than the forces of goodwill. And it may well be that we will have to repent in this generation not merely for the vitriolic words of the bad people and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. Somewhere we must come to see that social progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. While today we marvel at the extraordinary accomplishments of our founding fathers, their own reaction to this U.S. Constitution, when it was presented to them for their signatures, was considerably less enthusiastic. Benjamin Franklin, ever the optimist, even at the age of 81, gave what was for him a remarkably restrained assessment in his final speech before the Constitutional Convention. When you assemble a number of men to have the advantage of their joint wisdom, you inevitably assemble with those men all their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinion, their local interests, and their selfish views. He thought it impossible to expect a perfect production from such a gathering, but he believed that the Constitution that they had just drafted with all its faults, was better than any alternative that was likely to emerge. Nearly all of the delegates harbored objections, but persuaded by Franklin's logic, they put aside their misgivings and affixed their signatures to it. Their overriding concern was the tendency in nearly all parts of the young country toward disorder and disintegration. Americans had used the doctrine of popular sovereignty, democracy, as the rationale for their successful rebellion against English authority in 1776. But they had not yet worked out fully the question that was plaguing all nations aspiring to democracy, democratic government, ever since how to implement principles of popular majority rule while at the same time 
preserving stable governments that protect the rights and liberties of all the citizens. Few believed that a new federal constitution alone would be sufficient to create a unified nation out of a collection of independent republics spread out over a vast physical space, extraordinarily diverse in their economic interests, regional loyalties, and ethnic and religious attachments. And there would be new signs of disorder after 1787 that would remind Americans what an incomplete and unstable national structure they had created. Settlers in western Pennsylvania rebelled in 1794 because of taxes on their locally distilled whiskey. In western North Carolina, there were abortive attempts to create an independent republic of Franklin, (laughs) which would ally itself with Spain to ensure its independence from the United States. There was continued conflicts with Indians across the whole western frontier and increased fear of the slave unrest, particularly when news of the slave-led revolution in Haiti reached American shores. But as fragile as Americans' federal edifice was at the time of the Founding Fathers and the founding of our country, there was much in the culture and environment that contributed to a national consensus and cohesion A common language, a solid belief in the principles of English common law, and constitutionalism, a widespread commitment, albeit in diverse forms, to the Protestant religion, a shared revolutionary experience, and perhaps, most important, an economic environment which promised most free white Americans, if not great wealth, at least an independent sufficiency. Rugged individualism. The American statesmen who succeeded those of the founding generation served their country with a self-conscious sense that the challenges of maintaining a democratic union were every bit as great after 1787 as they were before. Some aspects of their nation-building program, their continuing toleration of slavery and genocidal policies towards American Indians are fit objects of national shame, not honor. But statesmen of succeeding generations, Lincoln foremost among them, would continue the quest for a more perfect union. Such has been our success in a building of powerful and cohesive democratic nation-state, sovereign country. In the post-Civil War America, that most Americans today assume that principles of democracy and national harmony somehow naturally go hand in hand, but as we look around the rest of the world in the post-Soviet era, we find ample evidence that democratic revolutions do not inevitably lead to national harmony or universal justice. We see that the expression of popular will can create a cacophony of discordant voices leaving many baffled about the true meaning of majority rule. In far too many places around the world today, the expression of the popular will is nothing more than the unleashing of primordial forces of tribal and religious identity, which further confound the goals of building stable and consensual governments. As we look at the state of our federal union, 200 plus years later, at the founders completed their work There is cause for satisfaction that we have avoided many of the plagues afflicting so many other societies. But this is hardly cause for complacency. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night 
of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. To be sure, the U.S. Constitution itself has not only survived the crisis confronting it in the past, but in so doing, it has itself become a survivor, not only of the crises of the past, but in our nation's most powerful symbol of unity, a far preferable alternative to a monarch or a national religion. Institutions on which most nations around the world have re relied. Moreover, our Constitution is a stronger, better document than it was when it initially emerged from the Philadelphia Convention. Through the amendment process, in particular through the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 19th amendments, it has become the protector of the rights of all people, not just some of the people. On the other hand, the challenges to national unity under our Constitution are, if anything, far greater than those confronting the infant nation in 1787. Although the new nation was a pluralistic one by standards of the 18th century, the face of America in 1998, 2021, and on looks very different from the original. We are not, no longer a people united by a common language, religion, or culture. And while our overall level of material prosperity is staggering by the standards of age and income inequality is a rightful parasitic virus infecting our country as the 1% own more wealth than the bottom 90% combined. The conditions that threaten to undermine our sense of nationhood bound up in the debate over slavery and manifested in intense sectional conflict during the pre-Civil War era today present a more complex arena. Mostly because of the tragic legacy of slavery, a racial climate marked too often by mutual mistrust and misunderstanding and a condition of desperate poverty. Income inequality with our inner cities that has left many young people so alienated that any standard definition of citizenship becomes meaningless. More commonly, but in the way long, alarming tens of millions of Americans have been turned off by corrupting effects of money in politics, money on the political system, bombarded with negative advertising with their candidates, propaganda. Deregulation of Wall Street. Regulation of our free speech. By technocrats in Silicon Valley. If there is a lesson in all of this, it is that our Constitution is neither a self-actuating nor self-correcting document. It requires the constant attention and devotions of all citizens. This is a story often told that upon exiting the Constitutional Convention, Benjamin Franklin was approached by a group of citizens asking what sort of government the delegates had created. His answer was, a republic, if you could keep it. The brevity of that response should not cause us to undervalue its essential meaning. Democratic republics are not merely founded upon the consent of the people. They are also absolutely dependent upon the active and informed involvement of the people for their continued good health. We have been chosen by our founding fathers as an intricate part of a living document and a republic. If we can keep it. Hey guys, this is Tommy. Tommy Nation. How's everyone doing today?